Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. If you've ever taken a music theory class, it probably started off with what amounts to a set of rules. Certain notes and chords have certain default behaviors, and good music lets them behave the way they want. As you get to more advanced classes, you'll learn exceptions to those rules and more complex ways of applying them, and if your teacher is good, they might even stress that these are the rules of Western tonal music, not just all music ever made. But ultimately, the message is still that these rules probably lie at the heart of most of the music you actually listen to and want to make. But what if that's not true? What if it's just one of many possible rule sets, and more importantly, what if you've actually known that your entire life? This video is sponsored by Skillshare. How do we know which sets of musical rules you actually know? Well, that's what music cognition research is for, and to get a better sense of what it can tell us, I want to look at a study by neuroscientist Dr. Dominique Vouvan and music theorist Dr. Bryn Hughes, where they examine one of the most important musical rules in all of Western tonal music cadences. Cadences are basically just the last couple chords in a phrase, serving to either wrap things up or imply further motion. There's a couple main types of cadences that you'd probably learn about in music theory class, but the big dog is what's known as the authentic cadence, which is the resolution from the 5 chord to the 1 chord. Now, if you haven't encountered this before, you may be thinking that calling it the authentic cadence is kinda pretentious. I mean, what does that say about all the other cadences? Are they fake? And if you ask your teacher, they'll probably explain that don't worry about it. I mean, sure, it makes it sound important, but that's because it is. The authentic cadence is the strongest sense of resolution you can get from two chords, and it, more than any other cadence, is the most satisfying way to close out a phrase. To paraphrase renowned music expert Marshall Mathers, all the other cadences are just imitating. That's the message you'll get from most music theory classes anyway, but Drs. Vouvan and Hughes were suspicious for one simple reason. In a lot of styles of modern music, the authentic cadence is nowhere to be found, and listeners don't seem to mind. Are we just willing to open overlook this poor choice of cadence, or is there something deeper going on? I mean, music theorists, including myself, have been claiming for years now that modern music operates with a different harmonic vocabulary than the more classical language we teach as music theory, but is there a way to prove that? they decided to find out. The experimental design was pretty straightforward. First, they played what they call a prime, which is basically just a short piece of music designed to get you thinking about a specific style. These primes were constructed using as many stylistic cues as possible, including rhythm, melody, instrumentation, and a whole lot more. If they wanted you to think classical music, they'd play this. Which, yeah, pretty classical. They also needed a modern style to compare it to, and they settled on rock because it has a long, instantly recognizable tradition that's both sonically and harmonically distinct from classical. They primed it like this. Which is a little 60s for my taste, but if the goal is to make me think rock music, then it definitely gets the job done. Once they have you primed in a certain style, they hit you with a cadence and ask you how well it fits. In order to keep your head in the right genre, the cadences are timbre matched, which is a fancy way of saying they use the same instruments. The classical cadences use a piano, while the rock ones have an electric guitar. They're playing the same notes, but the tone is different. Now, a brief aside on something that didn't really come up in the paper. Because the rock guitar is distorted, it runs into a phenomenon called intermodulation, where the interactions of the different notes in the chord wind up producing all these extra bonus frequencies that muddy up the sound. This is part of why heavily distorted styles often stick to power chords. Using really simple voicings with just a couple notes prevents the intermodulation from fundamentally changing the quality of your chords. But the cadences here use full chords. Does that impact the results we're gonna discuss? I mean... Maybe, there's no easy way to tease it out, but the fact is most guitars in rock are gonna use some level of distortion, so intermodulation is almost inevitable. If rock does have a distinct harmonic vocabulary, that vocabulary is built around intermodulation, so it seems reasonable to include it. Anyway, they could have tested all sorts of cadences, but for simplicity's sake, they decided to stick with two. The first was obviously the authentic cadence. As for the second one, if you're familiar with rock harmony, you might be expecting the plagal cadence, or 4-1 resolution, and that'd make sense. It's by far the most common resolution resolution in rock music. Heck, there's a pretty popular four-chord loop that's just the plagal cadence over and over again, but the authors decided not to use it here because, while it's clearly the biggest cadence in rock, it's pretty popular in classical too. It's even nicknamed the Amen cadence for its frequent use at the end of hymns, so it wouldn't feel out of place in either style. If the goal was to establish a difference between the two, you need something that only shows up in one of them. For that, they settled on flat 7 to 1. Technically speaking, this doesn't even appear on the list of cadences most of us learn, because that list is 
derived from what's called common practice, a pretentious name for the vocabulary of classical music. The idea that flat 7 could resolve to 1 comes mainly from jazz, where it's called the backdoor resolution, but for the sake of consistency, I'm gonna call it the backdoor cadence for the rest of this video. While it's no plagal cadence, the backdoor cadence does show up fairly often in rock, and since it's basically unheard of in classical, it's a perfect way to differentiate between the two. From there, they just had to get a bunch of test subjects and see what happened. They'd play the prime, then one of the two timbre-matched cadences, then ask them to rate how well the cadence fit with a prime on a scale of 1 to 6. They repeated this in all 12 keys, twice each in a random order, then switched to the other style. Then they smashed the data together and did some math to it. What did they find? Well, let's get the easy one out of the way first. With a classical prime, participants strongly preferred the authentic cadence. It was rated on average at 4.5 out of 6, while the backdoor cadence was down around 3. On the rock side, though, there was no significant difference at all. Both the authentic and backdoor cadences were rated slightly over 3.5, so if this result is to be believed, the authentic cadence holds no special place in the vocabulary of rock. It's just one of the many equally appropriate ways to approach the one chord. Or, I say one of many, but again, they only tested two chords. Personally, I'd love to see what the results would have looked like if they'd included the plagal cadence as well, since it seems to be rock's go-to resolution. Might be interesting as a follow-up experiment or something. But of course, the if this result is to be believed bit is important. Every study has caveats, and I think it's worth looking at some of them here. First, there's the obvious problem that the participants were recruited from college campuses, many of them with formal musical training, so they may not be representative of the population at large. This is an issue with most psychological research, and I don't think it's especially relevant here, but it's always worth being aware of. A more specific issue, though, is the question they asked. I think there's two main ways of framing this. The analytical frame, where you ask if the cadence fits with the prime, and the experiential frame, where you ask if the cadence feels good, resolved, or whatever, and just let the prime inform that answer. They went with the former, but I've been talking as if it implies the latter. Is that a problem? I decided to ask the authors, and they assured me that no, not really. The analytical approach is standard for this sort of research, but some studies have used the experiential frame instead, and the results are highly correlated. That is, it seems like our sense of what fits and our sense of what feels good are linked enough that we can pretty reasonably use one as a proxy for the other. And the last issue I want to mention is with the primes themselves. Let's listen to the classical prime again. Did you hear it? There, in the last two bars. It's an authentic cadence. It's a bit less obvious than the block voicings they use for the actual tests, but it's the same harmonic motion. Meanwhile, the rock prime... ends in a plagal cadence instead. I asked the authors about this too, and they explained that the use of a stylistically appropriate cadence was one of the cues they used in order to establish the style. If they want you thinking classical, they can't really use a backdoor cadence, can they? That's not a classical sound. But that's a bit circular. Isn't it possible that the preceding harmony, not the style, was what drove the results in the first place? This can't be the whole picture, because it doesn't really explain why the backdoor cadence scored higher in rock than classical, but still, it's a weird thing to overlook. Fortunately, they didn't. Doctors Ruven and Hughes are actually pretty good at what they do, and they preempted me here with a second study. Basically, the first experiment used as many cues as possible in order to ensure that they successfully evoked the style, but that makes it hard to tease out which ones actually mattered. Was it the sound of the instruments, the rhythms, the melodies, or maybe it was just the harmony itself? In order to test this, they decided to strip it down to just one single factor, one that's obviously and intrinsically linked with genre, the timbre. In the second study, they used a piano for classical and a distorted guitar for rock, but beyond that, everything else was the same. They just played the one chord couple times to establish the key, then played a cadence to see how it felt. Here's the classical authentic cadence. and all the others were basically just that, but with different chords and instruments. So what did they find? Well, there's good news and bad news. The good news is the effect still exists. People like the authentic cadence more on the piano than the electric guitar, while their views on the backdoor cadence didn't really change. The bad news is the effect was weaker here. People still like the authentic cadence more in both styles. There's a couple ways to interpret this result. Maybe timbre alone isn't enough to evoke the different genres, or maybe the rest of the effect was driven by the difference in cadences used in the primes. Or maybe be both. Honestly, probably both. That's the thing with cognition research. The human brain is complicated and variables are hard to isolate, so it's almost always more than one thing. The point, though, is that both results confirm that if you can just get someone to think about rock music, the supremacy of the authentic cadence starts to collapse. Now, this may all seem obvious to you. I mean, music theorists have been saying for a long time that rock has a different vocabulary, so maybe it's not surprising that research would confirm it, but I still think it's important. If nothing else, defenders of classical ideals will often cite some pretty dodgy science and math 
path to prove that their music is objectively the best, so it's good to have some studies of our own that show the deep cultural dependencies of even pretty basic musical ideas. But more than that, I think this gives us some really fascinating insights into how music affects our brains, and while I've long held that rock music has its own vocabulary, I'm not sure I would have predicted this result. I'd probably guess that people's experience of cadences would change based on what styles they preferred, so rock fans would care less about the authentic cadence than people who listen to more classical music, but the idea that individuals are doing this sort of musical code switching, literally changing their preferences when they listen to different styles, is amazing. There's a lot more research to be done in this area, but I'm excited to see where it goes. But the evolution of music didn't stop with rock either. We're constantly developing new styles, along with new tools to make those styles work. In modern music, it's hard to overstate the influence of Ableton Live, and if you want to learn to use it, you should check out Brian Jackson's courses on Skillshare. He has four classes on it, starting from the very beginning and walking you through all the steps you need to use this important piece of software. If you've been looking to experiment with music technology in general, or Ableton in specific, Jackson's courses are a great way to get started. And that's just one of the thousands of lessons on Skillshare, including classes on songwriting, instruments, and audio engineering, plus other important skills like cooking, marketing, and productivity. If you want to give it a shot, the first thousand 12-tone viewers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium, and if you like what you see, sticking around is super affordable, with premium plans starting under 10 bucks a month. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to this video's featured patrons, Duck and Howard Levine. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.